Okay, um, so thank you everyone for joining us. We're very happy this week to have uh, George Kaliadakis. So George got his PhD from MIT. He then went on to be a lecturer at MIT and then had positions uh, at Stanford, NASA, Princeton, and is now currently a full professor at Brown. Um, he's a fellow of many different bodies, including SIAM, the American, the American Physical Society, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, an associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and um, Astronautics. Um, he's won many prizes, including the Cyan ACM Prize on Computational Science and Engineering, the Alexander von Humboldt Award, um, the Cyan Ralph Hyman Award, um, the J. Tinsley Odin Medal, and the CFD Award. So we're very happy to have him speak um, at our and our seminar this week is going to be talking on approximating functions, functionals and operators using deep neural networks for diverse applications. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can, yes. Yeah, thanks. So, so I would like to start uh, um, this talk by treating you all to some coffee, although it's a virtual coffee. Um, so when I give these talks, I, I give lots of applications, but I only gonna show one or two applications today. And this one, the reason I show this one is to, to, to make the point that, uh, well, it's a, of course, a problem of great interest to me and all mathematicians around the world, I'm sure. <laughs> the, uh, everybody's drinking coffee. But uh, I wanted to make the point that um, with these methods now on neural networks and uh, their variants, we can solve problems that we could not solve before with with scientific computing and 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 for example here i want to infer the velocity and the pressure above the espresso cup in 3d and the only thing i have given i was given is some measurements from my good friends from la vision although you can see it's a it's a toy toy uh, experiment it, it takes a lot of cameras and so on so these are Pressures data and what they record in 3D is basically density gradients. So now can you use density gradients, which is an auxiliary variable to go to the primary variables, which is velocity and pressure in 3D and time. That problem is ill posed, no boundary conditions, not models. You have to postulate the models and so on. So that thing about that, I'll get back to this problem a little later. But basically, by the way of introduction, I want to my group. Uh, for the last um, six years, we have been trying to use neural networks and before that um, GPs to integrate data and physics in a seamless way. So typically, this is what we've been doing for a long time, where we have lots of physics, well-posed problems, small data for the boundary initial conditions. This is what we have in most of cases in reality. Uh, it's gray boxes. Some We know some of the physics, not all the physics. Even if we know the physics, we may not be able to resolve it at the fidelity that we want. So, so to this end, I will talk about physics informed neural networks. Then we have these black boxes. Can we identify systems? And uh, where we have lots of data, maybe no physics, or if we have the physics, we just use it to generate data, but it will be a data-driven approach and so on. Now, physics informed neural networks. Um, has been very, very popular since we introduced it uh, four years ago. Uh, we get a patent on it, but uh, um, about uh, two years ago, um, Yetsen Huang, who is the CEO of NVIDIA, spent like 10 minutes in his talk in Supercomputing 19 to talk about AI for science, in particular, to talk about physics in neural networks and how actually they use, they used uh, physics informed neural networks to design running on their GPUs to design their new GPUs, what they just came out to this year, the A100. So, so Ricey, Mazia Ricey, my postdoc, um, went there and worked with them. And now NVIDIA have their own sort of industry of commercial codes, which um, uh, they bundle with their hardware. So it's, 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 it's not just a, a curiosity. It's not just another method we propose. It's actually something that a lot of people use it. Okay, so let me, for those of you who have not seen it before, a pin is a composite neural network. It um, has the data part, like you can see here on the left. And then there is uh, associated with some mismatch of data. I'm talking about regression here. And then 
uh, of course, we don't have enough data in science. You never have enough data. So these data have to satisfy some other equations. These equations could be nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It could be some parameterized equations. And F1 and F2 here will be the residuals, which will try to make them zero. So we penalize also the residual. So here in the total loss, what Adal have is a uh, sort of weighted, weighted sum of, of, the, of all the losses. Uh, and, and so on, and then that just pretty standard. So you can see in 10 lines of terms of flow, you can basically, uh, you're basically done. That's why um, the industry likes it and the academics also like it because they say they can do much, much better than this. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's what the original idea was. Um, there's some other variations here. I want to talk about um, weighted residual methods, which of course are the method of choice in, uh, in industry if, if, or with using finite elements, they're all commercial codes uh, used and so on. There's of course theory in finite elements, theory of more than 50 years now, but I just want to remind everyone when the finite elements came around the first time in the 60s, there was not, not very much theory, even in the 70s and 80s, there was only very little theory on linear problems. Today, of course, it's much different. But anyway, what I show you just now, the formulation is shown here, this is the residual associated with a PDE. This is the residual associated with the boundary conditions. And this is the residual associated with the um, initial conditions. And you can, you can change the, the norms here. Recently, we published a paper on meta-learning the loss functions for pins. And we show actually that the um, MSC, the, the L2 norm is not necessarily the best. It depends actually on the PDE, on the regularity, and so on. OK. That, uh, we'll not talk about that, but I want to, to uh, show you this other class of methods uh, of pins, which uses this idea of, of um, variational residuals. So instead of trying to satisfy the way we, we do this, we basically compute the residuals at random points in the domain. Okay, and of course, all the operators are done with automatic differentiation. So, so we totally remove the tyranny of having to do mesh generation and so on. When we introduce um, these um, test functions, and I want to talk about what kind of projections we have here. Of course, U tilde is the neural network. So we have this nonlinear space, right? This nonlinear approximation for neural networks. But then my test functions are different. So this is in the in the class of schemes called Petro-Galerkin. Uh, it's not a Galerkin because the test functions and the trial basis are different. So I can choose, therefore, my test basis. So here, for example, I can choose polynomials, I can choose signs, uh, I can choose orthogonal polynomials, and so on. Or I can, if I, if I use this to be also uh, the neural network, that would be like a, a sort of a deep Galerkin method. And, and correspondingly, you have loss functions which look like that. Again, now this will be... Uh, of course, you need to compute this integral, unlike the first method, which is very simple. You, you just have uh, sprinkle points. You, you, you generate extra points. That's why I call it physics informed. Some people call it physics constraint, which irritates me because physics is, is there to liberate us. And in fact, what we do, we use the physics to generate more points to inform the network. So that's why it's the proper term, I think, in my opinion, is physics informed. Now, here I have a sort of um, a general framework for solving PDEs, as you can see here, again, the neural network on the left, it's the same parameter space. So all one parameter space, all this is done with automatic differentiation. So you can have a version which we call HP. Um, HP stands for high order finite elements, what I call spectral elements. That was my thesis back at MIT 35 years ago. So, so this, uh, the, the, this version can also be encoded here. So in other words, instead of having, like in this case, one, one domain where you have test functions everywhere, you can actually have the domain being a, um, the neural network, the, the, the trial spaces, one, and then you can have subdomains where you test, you put test functions. So, you, you, so you're testing the variation, the variational form um, in, in subdomains. So you sort of, it's, this is, Kind of interesting because you can sort of zoom in where you want actually using the test functions. Um, and then there's these other methods, uh, the, the deep Galerkin method. They're using for test functions, they're using um, a uh, the residual again, 
uh, UNN, of course, is the solution to the network. So I have the literature here, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> uh, but with this framework, basically, all, uh, all these variants can be, uh, can be explained just using this um, uh, general framework. Um, and just a little bit more on the losses. Again, what you will have here is the modes, but they all look like that. This, this constant, these penalty parameters could be trainable. So at every point you can have, and you can use a steepest ascent to compute them. So that's kind of, now an important, an important uh, extension, um, which is, has the flavor of domain decomposition, but, but is different than HP in a sense that for the HPV uh, uh, version had one neural network. Here now I want to go to two, two different neural networks. For example, here I decompose the space dime do domain to solve this uh, Berger's equation. And I can have these arbitrary decompositions that nobody else <laughs> can have because as you know, it's very difficult to parallelize time and decompose time. So here the blue C is one neural network and the dolphin is another neural network. And of course you can tune them differently and, and so on. Now, how would you stitch together the PD solution in, in, in such a domain? Um, there's a very simple extension of what we've done before where you take the residual here in the blue C and you take the residual in the dolphin um, and you penalize the difference. Of course, residual has to be zero. So it's, 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 it's at least C zero. So you penalize the difference. And by doing that, you actually have a very, very um, uh, general framework. So X pin um, is, is quite useful in practice, of course, because of the expressivity for multi-scale problems, especially multi-physics problems, and also the fact that you can parallelize this and you can get really good parallelism out of it. Now, does it always outperform PIN? This is um, a question that uh, uh, one of my collaborators, Kenzie, who is just logged in, um, uh, is, is, is looking at what is the relative from a theoretical point of view, what are the relative adva advantages of pins versus X pins and in the context, especially of generalization and generalization, as you know, is a difficult question, especially when you deal with neural networks and PDs and ill pose problems. But anyway, that's a, it's an upcoming paper, great paper, I think contribution by Kenzie. Um, just to show you that you can compute some of this analytically, if you have one or two shallow layers, Let's say, let's say this nonlinear Berger's equation. Matt, I, I assume that you still can hear me, right? Yes, yeah, we can hear you now. Yes, we're having technical issues on our end, but I think, um, I think you're okay. All right, you didn't, you didn't miss much. <laughs> okay. okay, so I'm looking at this equation here. It's a nonlinear PDE. And I say, if I use a variational form of this physics in form neural networks, um, of course, you can integrate by parts, so you can transfer all the derivatives in the neural network or in the test functions to smooth and so on. So there's really nice advantages that, that you cannot realize in, in standard uh, uh, numerical methods. But uh, anyway, I, I just want to show you this, that you can derive these residuals. And I, these are three different residuals in analytical form where I take my activation functions to be signs here, and I take my test functions to be signs. So now I have derived for one, layer, I have de de derived analytically different residuals, which they, they look different because I integrate by parts or not, integrate twice by parts or not, and so on that people are doing infinite elements. So, so anyway, in this case, I have analytically obtained the residuals and I can do a very good job in, in the optimization and I can um, get accuracy just like spectral methods. Typically, you will not get accuracy better than, um, than 10 to the minus 5 because of the um, beast that is called optimization. Now, I, 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 just for fun, you can use also test functions that we use in HP methods like Legendre polynomials, and then you get a recurrent formula. And again, I can compute these this, um, uh, residuals uh, analytically. Uh, what's interesting about it, it's at least for some cases, you can see how the residuals look, what the landscape, if you have subtle points and so on. So they could be benchmark problems. But just to, sh to show you the solution that we, that we obtain here, the errors, as you can see down, the L-infinite norm for this solution is 10 to the minus 9. Typically, we don't get anything better than 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 if we 
don't, you know, in, in the if we solve the general optimization problem, not because the approximation error, I want to emphasize that because of the optimization error and somewhat the generalization error, but optimization error. Let me go back to my coffee and then I will proceed with some math. We published this paper a couple of years ago on, on basically what I show you with a, with a, with a coffee. If you, if you have some visualization somewhere in the domain, can you use models like that? These models now is a bunch of PDEs, passive scalar, Navier-Stokes, divergence-free projections, and so on. So you only have the dye visualization, like the, the, the gradient of the density or the temperature. Can you get velocity? We call it hidden fluid mechanics because it resembles like a hidden Markov processes in some loose sense. Uh, so, so you are given something auxiliary, like a passive scalar. Can you extract the primary, which is the velocity and pressure? And, uh, and here I want to show you a movie. This is just one plane. This is real data in the center plane. This is the data. You match the data. Okay, this is a data term in the loss function, but but then you have from the models you can extract pressure, you can extract um, also the velocity, which of course you don't give. You're not given any data. You're not given boundary conditions. So, so that shows you that you can do really uh, lots of problems. Now, um, we wrote pa a paper in Nature uh, reviews recently to um, talk about all this how you physics inform learning in general. But uh, I just have an alphabet of pins here. Uh, these pins can solve fractional equations, stochastic pins, ex the extend pins, and so on. I'll show you. As I said, it's a huge success in industry, and uh, for the first time in my life, I've been talking to all these companies that now they want them to make it part of the um, of of their um, arsenal of tools that they have. Ansys, big Telemann conference, uh, even even uh, other companies, Bosch in Germany, Siemens, and so on. Anyway. So how about, how about theoretical work on pins? Because in addition to, you can imagine in addition to what we have in, in, in neural networks, approximation, generalization, and, and optimization, we, we have to deal with uh, nuances of PDEs, ill pose problems that I'm trying to solve and so on. So at least for linear, this is the first paper we published with for linear PDEs, elliptic and parabolic in particular, because there, so, so what we wanted to show you there is that we actually have, at least show convergence. So in other words, convergence in what sense? Well, we have some data, or I may not have any data, but I have now, I sample the residual of the PDE at random points in the domain. And then I double these points, and then I have more points and more points. Is this sequence converging to the solution of a PDE? Okay, so we use this Schauder approach and, and some uh, weak maximum principle, you can look at this paper. So without any boundary conditions, we show that actually, yes, in this case, we can converge in the L2 sense. Okay. If in addition, again, this is for elliptic and parabolic only. In addition, if we also use the um, boundary conditions, we can improve convergence to H1. And then with some other arguments, we also show some generalization of this, of this approach. Um, I'll spend more time on this, another paper where we estimated uh, errors, both a priori and a posteriori errors. And, and, and you can write this as a discrete formulation in the sense that I have, I have these residual points, as, as I said before, where I compute my residuals. Some people call collocation points, just like in classical methods. Or if I take M to infinity, that will be the continuous version of, of let's say, my uh, my loss function. So in a nutshell, what we, we can show is that stability and existence of a PDE and the, un the universal approximation uh, property would lead to convergence for, con for the continuous formulation when you have an infinite number of residual points where you compute your, uh, loss, uh, your loss function. Now, in the case of discrete norm, when we have finite number, numbers of particles, uh, you also have to have stability in the discrete form, which we can show you, we can show based on, on uh, the bursting inequalities for one, 2D and 3D dimensions. Uh, beyond that, though those inequalities are not valid. So we have to, to assume that we have this uh, Radamacher complexity in the, uh, in the inequality. So I'm, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on this. So let's take we have this linear PDE and, and, and these boundary conditions, we define the spaces. 
So the physics informed neural network in, in, in mathematical form is like this, right? We want to find a network that minimizes this uh, standard feed forward neural network. We, we work with other neural networks, but it's uh, not important. Okay, so the continuous formulation again is, is this. Remember, tau is a penalty parameter, tau, let's say ta, take tau greater than one and, and y and z are proper spaces. Y, n, and z sub n are subspaces to the continuous spaces. So that will give a discrete formulation. So first for the continuous case, we need to have stability of the solution. And up here, you can, you can interpret A against the PDE operator, B is the boundary operator. And you can interpret this as equivalence of norm. So I, my assumption is that I, I need this to be greater than um, the norm of U in some space V and less than X and X has to be a subset of, of V. Um, do, do I satisfy that? Well, yes. Let's say for the elliptic equation, if I take V to be H one half, it's fine. And then if I take Z to be the L two, and then the X is a H space here. If I have advection, I can just take the, L, the H1 here, and that's definitely reads as equivalent to norm. If I have time, uh, so if I if if, uh, if time dependent, uh, of course, here I have the bounded variation. So so you can find the classes of of PDs where where you can satisfy this um, the stability. Now having the norm equivalence, as I said, and then the assuming universal approximation of neural networks then we can prove that if y is the LP space and z is the LP space again, then the, we can get an a posteriori estimate in terms of the loss, as you can see here. And P is of course the space LP and C1 is the constant that goes into the equivalence of norms. We can also get a priori estimate just like we do in spectral approximation, for example, where you can see here, we have the best approximation in the space X. And then this is just a little bit of a modifier to deal with, um, with some regularity that we need for the proofs. So this shows, of course, that uh, we have um, bounded errors uh, and so on, up and, and some converges. It, when we get to the discrete case, again, the, 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 the formulation is the same, just this is sub subspaces that you can see here, I define uh, this weight spaces. I need this assumption. The assumption basically say that in the, my discrete norm, I need at least half of the continuous form, okay? And as I said, you can actually prove this based on, on bursting inequalities and Mashkar many years ago uh, have, have shown that and we use some of his work here. And in this case, again, you can um, eventually find with this assumption, you can find the inequality that you want and then you can get similar error estimates that I don't show here. When, so this is a for low dimensional problem. When we go to high dimensional problems, we have to, you cannot do that. So, so instead we have to do a numerical integration. We do something like that, the Monte Carlo. And then we introduce a Rademacher complexity as I do here. A lot of you, I'm sure are working on, on this. And then we can, uh, basically we need to have uh, this condition. Uh, and then we prove similar error estimates, which I will skip here. Uh, there in the, the paper, but that's basically going to, of course, you have a parametric PDE, that's where you would need to go be, beyond three dimensions. Uh, in this other variational cases, the story is kind of similar. Uh, if you look at this loss function here, the only new thing is that I have here this projection operator. And this projection operator, remember, I, I was it was like a Petro Galerkin type because I was using smooth polynomials, let's say for test functions, and then I was using a trial spaces, which is a new, it's a sort of a mixed. I don't know if anybody has done that before, but uh, we couldn't find anything. But anyway, the, the theory is similar, but again, you need to have the discrete norm here has to be at least one half of the continuous form. And the same thing for, for the boundary data. And if you do that, you get the a posteriori estimate here in terms of the square root of the loss function, and then also the a priori estimate in terms of the best approximation, plus this, um, the correction, this mollifier, which I had before. So, so in other words, if you use just like this collocation type pins or variational project, uh, project, projection methods, mixed projection methods, uh, the results are kind of similar. I don't know how sharp are this, but, uh, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm sure there, 
improvements. I, I, I just want to spend some more time on, on the second part to talk about operator regression. And I want to tease you with this big uh, simulation. Uh, if, you, if you've never done a simulation um, of physical systems, this is a true Navy destroyer with autonomous going into an Atlantic sea, uh, rough, rough state, sea state eight, which means 20 meters wave. Okay, so, so imagine you're trying to work on autonomy and somebody asks you to de de develop a neural network that does that. Well, no, good luck. <laughs> because you need, you need to send a fleet out there to get data. So you have to resort to simulation instead. So what we did is we went to MIT. I work at MIT and, and the students there are very patient, very, very patient. So one of the simulations takes one week <laughs> and we need about a thousand simulations. So, so we, um, we hired a lot of MIT students <laughs> and they did this. I hope nobody from MIT listens to, to this talk. And, and so they did this simulation and then we said, okay, um, the idea is of course to predict this uh, motion you know, you have free surface, you have waves, you have stochastic excitations, lots of stuff. But what you really care is, is some sort of a functional of the motion of this vessel, right? And then uh, in real time, in real time, that's important. So I was wondering at the time, can we approximate functionals? Later, I'll talk about operators, nonlinear continuous operators. But, but can we approximate functions? And I found this this um, jewel paper by Chen and Chen from Fudan University. That, as you can see here, it appeared at the same time as the Saipengo uh, theorem and other theorems for, for functional approximation. But this was actually for functional approximation in 1D and in 3D, in multi multi-dimensions. And this tells us basically that the standard neural network can approximate the functional. So, so having this knowledge, then you can pick up a RNN or an LSTM that we did here. Uh, this is a stochastic excitation of the two, two, two instances of excite, stochastic excitation. The response is stochastic, but basically any, any LSTM off the shelf sequence to sequence would do a good job in this. And indeed, we verify that um, using now this LSTM, you can uh, project, you can predict, forecast the motion of the vessel in 0.01 second instead of one week. All right. Now, we want more, of course. We want to look at uh, operator regression. I was al always interested in that. So I, I we published a paper recently, but uh, in Nature Machine Intelligence, that 60 pages paper that has lots of results, theoretical and practical. Basically, we wanted to replace all calculus to, to teach a neural network calculus. Same thing of all the mathematical tra train a, a neural network. Can you do that? Can you make the neural network solve these equations in real time? Uh, not just integer calculus, fractional calculus, stochastic PDEs, and so on. So, so I'm asking, I'm very ambitious. I'm asking for lots of things. Can, can we do that? And, and is there a theory, okay? And uh, so, of course, going from function, a function approximation to operator approximation, you go to infinite dimensional spaces. So it's not trivial, but of course the upshot is that you can do a lot of things um, that you cannot do otherwise. And guess what I, uh, I found? Another theorem by Chen and Chen, <laughs> in, uh, that this was written in 1995, that says it, a single neural network, at that time in the 90s, we're talking about single neural network, single layer. If, if G is the nonlinear or continuous operator we want to approximate, G of U of Y, Y is the output space, and you take U, a function from a compact input space V in this continuous setting, and, and then we map it to N2C to of K2, then indeed, there is a neural network that we can write down explicitly here, which can approximate the nonlinear continuous operator uh, arbitrarily accurately, epsilon. Okay, it doesn't tell you how to do it exactly, but, it, actually, but actually this is very suggestive of what you can try. And I'll show you that. But just uh, to, to, to identify, so U is the input that you sample at let's say M number of sensors. And then this is the output. Notice that the output, I call it the trunk. The output is also a neural network and you can see sigma is, a, is an activation function. So both the input and the outputs are neural networks and they work together, right? So this, you can think of this as an inner product. This is basically just a coefficient. So, so this is a double expansion. So if you do that, this could inspire some different architectures. We settle on this one on the right. So basically this branch, 
will give you these coefficients here in p points. And then in the trunk, we have something some similar. And then we cross them and we get the g of u of y. So the output space is a continuous space as a neural network. That's important because. Um, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that the single neural network and you're, uh, you're, you're a single layer neural network and you're trying to approximate operators. We know what happens when we try to approximate functions. You need an infinite number of, of neurons. Here you have the curves of dimensionality in the input space if you, if you stay with a single layer. So we try to extend the theorem. So there's a rigorous proof of the theorem in the paper here, but we replace the branch and the trunk with deep neural networks. Otherwise, the assumptions are the same. We have a compact input space, continuous nonlinear operators, and so on. Okay, so um, the, the I'll give you a sketch of the construct of a constructive proof. There are other proofs, but uh, so first you you extend the output space D into this square domain. Okay, and then you can use. I will also assume also that the the input function u is, is um, approximated with piecewise uh, interpolation, piecewise constant. So just to simplify things. So then uh, I can I can write the output space, let's say with Fourier modes. Okay, so I have, I'm on P Fourier modes here. And then I can do an interpolation on, on, on this one, on G at the output using the output operator here. And then rearrange. And now I have to ask the question, if this and this can be approximated with with the neural network. So this is obvious because EK is the exponential, the Fourier exponentials, right? So that, that can be approximated with a deep neural network. This one here, because of the constraint you have on continuity in the appropriate interval that you sample is also a continuous. So we have a uniform approximation. So therefore I can have a deep neural network for that as well, roughly speaking. So it, the proof is not very difficult. Um, now, to, to derive any error estimates, you need to have some assumptions. And, and, and here we'll assume holder continuity. In my pins earlier on, I forgot to say that also the, in the first paper, we also assume holder continuity. Holder continuity, of course, applies to many operators, not all, all of them, but for example, in linear advection reaction equations of this form, Leon's and, and so on a long time ago, show that you can, you can have Lipschitz continuity and therefore you can have holder continuity. Even hyperbolic scalar laws, you can see here, uh, you can have that and uh, you, you have total variation. Uh, so using this, we try to derive a, a, um, an error estimate and G is a linear, for a linear operator G. Nonlinear is very difficult for a linear operator. And you can see here, we're not quite there. Uh, P is the number of modes at the output. Them is the number of sensors associated with the input. These are the, the quantities parameters of the network. And you can see there's NL, L and P that's sort of increasing, although this decreases. So that's a, that's a, a large, could be a large term. So the, you need to go to specific equations to take advantage of the operator. So, so we can do that for linear advection diffusion equation. We can do it for the Berger's equation. The Berger's and other conservation laws, integrable systems have some nice properties that you can actually reduce them. You can use a Kolhoff transform and you can reduce them to something else. So, so in this case, what is the problem setup? The problem setup is I have some parametric, some, so basically I want to map the initial conditions to the solution for the Berger's equation, okay? So I take an arbit arbitrary, let's say arbitrary, uh, initial condition uh, for the Berger's and I, I map it to the solution at time t equals uh, fixed. Okay, so that's, and I want to do that fast. Uh, so you can see here for, we can, we can reduce that error, the troublemaker, this error here, we can replace it with a term that reads like, um, like this. So, so I have actually something that, uh, that decays with m to minus one half. Let me just give you an idea of how we proved it. And I think there are some, there may be some other proofs um, which I will talk about later. But anyway, here is, um, uh, we, ca we can use the whole Kolhoff transform. Okay. So we can write u, g, take the initial conditions and, and, and uh, map it to u, the solution. k is this heat kernel. And V is, as you can see here, that's a Kolhoff transform. But basically U now is a rational approximation like that. 
and I can replace this with polynomial. So I have a rational polynomial to approximate. So U is represented by rational polynomials. And thanks to the work by Delgarski, we know that the rational approximation can, uh, rational polynomials can be approximated nicely by ReLU networks. And we also know the, so, so a rational polynomial can be approximated by the, this neural ReLU network plus order one over M. M is the number of sensors where you sample the solution which is basically a projection from infinite space to that. You can go through, um, let's, uh, if you use, let's say some, Simple, just like as before, and, and you find the error as I told you. For advection uh, diffusion reaction equations, you can do something similar. This is again, this is the output, this is the input. Uh, it's this term here, which now S is minus one fourth. Before S was minus one third. We also did like a Poisson equation, that's minus one third. This is one minus four. So anyway, we, we see convergence. Um, having this now, you can sort of size your network. You can say how many uh, layers I can take on the trunk, on, a, on the branch, how you can coordinate it, how many neurons and so on. And so, 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 there, so it's sort of the beginning. It's not the end, it's the beginning of actually trying to do something more than empirically choosing some of these parameters. Of course, there's a generalization error and so on. Let me just give you a, a few examples and I'll finish here. One example will be um, very simple, just to set up. But just to set up ideas, what we're doing is we we will use lots of functions, as I have here. I will I will characterize the functions some somehow my input space V, for example, sample sample each function at many points, and then at the output, I don't want to sample my output at many points because that's that's costly, right? I, I, these are experiments or these are expensive initial simulations. So so you want to minimize that as much as possible. In other words, I, I don't want to have to face the, the curse of dimensionality at the input space in training this operator. So, so this schematic shows that the input, the output, and this is basically what I'll have, and I'll show you why. So let's start with this very simple example. I want to um, learn, I want to train the network deponent to how to integrate. In 1D, we've done, for 3D, we've done Laplace transforms and so on. You can actually have an undergraduate do this. So you take a U of T, and, and you map it to a S of X, as X can be from zero to one, could be zero to infinity, although we violate the theorem here, we are supposed to be in a compact space. So I take 10,000 integrands and I only evaluate S of X, as I told you at one point. Okay, so, so, so I don't have to do a lot of evaluations of integrals. I only, for each function, I only find one representative point, but I do it for 10,000. And as you can see here, I succeed in the sense that the mean square error goes down with the number of iterations to acceptable levels, 10 to the minus five. And if you compare with all sorts of other neural networks, the architecture I show you, the deep net has pretty small generalization errors, slightly, the, the testing error is slightly bigger than training error. We discover something interesting. We discover exponential convergence of these errors for this system, but also for PDs. So this is a, two pendula coupled together. Here we go from a input of UT to two outputs. So, so you don't have to mark to, to match uh, inputs and outputs. You can go from one output to hundred, uh, from one input to hundred outputs. Anyway, but this is just a standard uh, exercise. What we observe here, and this is for three different neural networks, we observe that the MSE goes down exponentially fast. The exponent is not that great, but definitely you can see up to some point where this, Convergence saturates and you have like a square root type, one over square root convergence. Here you have a little better. And that depends on the width of the neural network. The transition point here, how, how broad is this exponential convergence depends on the transition. How big is the network, the capacity of the network? So it seems that there is an architecture that we haven't been able actually to, to find a good architecture where we can pr preserve this exponential convergence because some theory I will talk about later, shows that indeed one can have exponential convergence uh, of the neural network. I said deponents are blazingly fast. There was a, a some article here in Quantum Magazine um, that was showing that, but they were comparing another uh, good network from Caltech. The Caltech neural network is called Fourier Neural Operator. 
uh, but they proposed uh, after us, a couple of years after. Uh, so they used the operator. The, I'm not going to give you the details, but uh, Fourier transform and, and um, Green's the Green's the Green's theorem for obtaining solutions of linear PDEs, and then you you put them through a uh, nonlinear activation function. But MIT technology review. I'm an MIT graduate, so I can say that MIT exaggerates too much what they're doing um, and what they write. They they saw they they said that you know with this FNO solves everything. Have your stokes turbulence everything <laughs> without needing retraining and so on. Lots of uh, of my friends called me up and complain that they thought I wrote this. I said no, but anyway. So I I, I took so we have a all summer long. Lots of postdocs and I are working on on proving the truth. So we do the very simple test. So let's say okay, let's start with this very simple waveform and do a linear advection of it, okay, and measure the errors. And you can see here the standard FNO they propose, the one that MIT Technology Review, call a winner, gives you a 50% error. We did some trickery and put some memory to make it a little more accurate, 10% error. But as you see, the errors of, of DuPont is 0.3%. So it's not quite right. Actually, in most of the applications, the two neural networks are the same, but when the solution regularity is not good, then it doesn't work. Let me show you an, an interesting example of DuPont. DuPont can learn fractional calculus. My, my PhD students don't want it to learn that. But, but um, we are very big on fractional calculus just because it's a very expressive like neural networks. So here's a, a question, can you, have a fractional derivative so you don't have to compute it. Um, so you have a deponent in fraction of a second, you can <clears throat> do that. Uh, the answer is yes, you can do it <clears throat> because you can have formulas for this <clears throat> and so on. But then for arbitrary functions, you can do it. Uh, the, here's a Caputo one derivative, which is used for time initial value problems. It looks like this. It's a singular kernel at t equals zero, you have singularity. But the reason I'm showing you this is to emphasize the importance of the input space. How do you um, represent these functions uh, discreetly? So I show you before I didn't talk about the details, but I represent it. Um, I committed a crime actually, because I use a Gauss random field to represent my input space, but that violates the compactness, right? Here, I switch from Gauss random field, which gives me this error to a polyfractonomial thing of a thing of a, a orthogonal polynomial space uh, and then I read all the gender something, but a, a space, a Fourier space or a wavelet space. Uh, so then, then the coefficients define the input space. It turns out that you can actually gain an order of accuracy by doing that. So the point I'm trying to make is that a key to deponet is actually what is the input space? How do you define it? How rich is that space? How expressive is that space? And this is an example. Uh, you can do stochastic PD, stochastic um, differential equations. Here, for example, um, we map B of X to, which is stochastic to Y. If, if this is a correlated process, you can use a Carhuen Loev. So now you can represent the B of X as a Carhuen Loev. Pro, uh, you know, depends on the correlation length. We've done now 100, actually, but at the time in the paper, we did only five dimensions. And, um, and then the, you modify the branch net to have these uh, eigenfunctions. Uh, weighted with the eigenvalues, and then the output space is also defined by this. So the so m here will be uh, so we're basically in six dimensional space because one space and five n equals five, so you are one in six, six dimensional space. And it turns out that uh, we can learn not just the statistics; we can learn these are ten different realizations actually of the instantaneous solution using the same seed. You can see solving this with the same some sort of accurate Monte Carlo or my favorite polynomial chaos and so on, you can find that you get these uh, right solutions for the smooth correlated inputs. I want to finish with this um, application, which is very hot now, it's called hypersonics. <laughs> so can we can we train a deep net to learn this multiphysics? Because here we have um, all sorts of shocks. We have chemistry, the air dissociates and so on. So, so it's one of my projects at DARPA, so I have to talk about it. Um, so can we learn Riemann problems like this, where you start with some arbitrary initial conditions and, and you have shocks in the velocity, 
but also in the density of these species and the species react. So you can see here, even for standard scientific computing, W E null doesn't work. So, so my colleague here, Ching Wan Shu, had to um, write another paper on, on, on doing monotonicity and so on. But he gave us his code so we could do like a thousand trajectories. I only use a hundred trajectories to train the depo net. And the way I did it here is um, I did the Lego, Lego approach to modeling where I take each one of these pieces from the initial condition is mapped to its corresponding. So I train a depo net for each one. And then I put all the depo net together like a, a Lego. Uh, and, and the way the, the input, the input function is actually the Riemann problem. You can see here, I have a Riemann problem on the pressure and I, I change the smoothness of, of, the, uh, of the jump. And, and you can also change the, the magnitude of the jump, but that's how I, I have an, a function as an input and functions as outputs and so on. So you can see here, like I can go from t equals zero to some time. These are relatively large times because it, if you have chemistry, the time step is 10 to the minus eight. So I can go in 0.01 second, I can get this solution. So I'm 10,000 times faster than the Eno code that gave me this. And let me tease you with this real application. This is a case where you have a wing of an airplane. It doesn't look like a wing, but, it, but and, and you, you have some discrete measurements. One, two, three, eight pressure sensors. So these are, let's say, thing of the wing of an airplane as you see the air by the by the wing, and, and you have four uh, pitot tubes there that measure the pressure. And from there, can you solve the ultimate ill-posed problem of solve of finding what type of disturbances cause these? So we train offline a deep O net and, and actually can do that in 0.01 second. It can find what is the inflow disturbances. Then if you have the inflow disturbances, the forward deep O net, uh, you can uh, solve to find this three dimensional field. As you can see, it's, it's not a trivial problem because we go from laminar to turbulent and so on. So you have to uh, have patient people who train this offline. So anyway, um, let me finish with the work of Sid Misra. I think he, did a good job with his students. Uh, and basically, they um, put this deponent in addition to the theory that we did. They, they show that deponents can break the curse of dimensionality, um, as I said, for the input space. Uh, they extended the theorem of Chen and Chen to have, um, I'll, I'll show it here, uh, this theorem here, to have the G to be a, not a continuous operator, but actually a Borel. Borel measure, measurable operator. So therefore you can do, you can justify the use of non-compact domains as I was doing in the applications. You can justify the use of non-continuous operators that you need in multi-scale problems and so on. Uh, they also found a, a upper and lower bound on the error and their approach was to sort of, this is sort of the whole thing is this is the input space. This is the output space. And this is the operator that maps this. So you basically have an error because of the encoding, right? You do a projection here. So there's an error associated with that, that, that will be um, uh, here, the encoding. Then you have an approximation in the neural network here, that will be this error. And then you have the reconstruction error associated with the output and that's an error. So, so basically you can have, they, they produce error outputs uh, like that. So I, I, they, they produce a document, 120 pages, which is, uh, is good and and uh, I know other people Caltech and are interested now in, in in doing also theory for FNO and, and operator regression. So let me finish with this one. This is my last one. Uh, it was a paper written by Deep Mind to to a couple of pages paper to say something about DeepOnet. That is, uh, they, you can train them using experimental data and um, and synthetic data for multi scale problems. Problems for which you don't know any physics, actually. You don't need to, if you just have lots of videos, you can replace the branch with a CNN and can learn from a video. We have done that for, for some biomedical problems we're working on and so on. So these are my sponsors. It was the first uh, physics inform consortium that I put together uh, even before Trump became, uh, became the president. And also another MURI where we're trying to take this to the next level to to have uh, to, to include meta learning of, of of all this because otherwise you need a very dedicated um, people to do this work as I as I said earlier. So with that, I will stop and take some questions. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, 